Lovely. Yes, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, lovely. Meeting yes. is now streaming on YouTube. Ashok, are we ready to go live? Not yet. I'm just setting up. Yeah, you okay. tell us whenever, whenever. So, Clement, everything okay in Chennai? Uh, yes, sir. Everything okay. Some areas are being sealed off as hotspots. Uh, there's a steady increase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are the people on the outskirts of Chennai behaving? Uh, as usual. <laughs> yeah. Nothing changes. <laughs> you can't say it's a complete lockdown, but they have needs to go out and come back. Yeah. Is it but official that there is no the lockdown now? Pardon? Is it official they're extending the lockdown? Most likely, yes, yes, yes. they're expecting two weeks. Ninety-nine percent. They've already owned up. Ninety-nine percent. Uh, we are live now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the the fifth uh, ski webinar. And today we have a very interesting and a hot topic, which is uh, on the ACL injuries and ACL reconstruction. And we have none other than. Uh, Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, who is going to take us through this. He has a rich experience in treating ACL patients. And today he's going to bring out, uh, out through his four to five cases on, you know, what are the current trends? Uh, what are the controversies going on? And how does one manage ACL injuries? So we have a, a very uh, rich panel again. We have uh, Bhushan, we have Dincha Pardiwala, we have Kanchan Bhattacharya, Mukesh Ladda, Raju Ishwaran, Jacob Vargis, Clement Joseph from Chennai, and we'll have Vikas Kanduja and Vikas Kapoor uh, tuning in soon. So over to uh, Sachin Tapasvi to take over this roundtable webinar presented to you by Ski. Okay, uh, thank you, Parag, and welcome everybody to the to this webinar. Essentially, looking at ACL injuries, uh, we have a rich panel here with uh, tons of experience. I mean, if we count the number of cases uh, between uh, these uh, eight to ten gentlemen. I think uh, easily you'll see more than, uh, we'll see an experience of over 10,000 ACLs treated by this whole panel. So essentially we'll be uh, going ahead and, what is this now? Yeah. Yeah, sharing. We'll be uh, uh, looking at some basic cases and uh, we'd like to have this interactive uh, for all of those who are participating uh, through the YouTube channel you have a YouTube uh, link box there in front of you. And uh, please feel free to put in and share your questions. Of course, your questions can be sent by WhatsApp to Raju, uh, to, sorry, to Ashok Shah and uh, Dr. Parag as well. And um, we start off with the first case. So this is a 32 year old male. He had a twisting injury during soccer on artificial turf. So nowadays, I at least I see a lot of these uh, patients getting coming in with injuries with uh, soccer that they play on weekends on artificial turf. And uh, probably they're not using the right shoes or whatever it is. Uh, these weekend warriors, they come in with these torn ACLs. So these are essentially, he had a non-contact injury. He's now three weeks post-injury. He has a range of motion from 2 to 135 degrees. On clinical exam, he has a grade two Lachman. He has a grade one pivot shift. And on detailed questioning, he wishes to stay active and definitely wants to go ahead and pursue his uh, career of uh, playing sport over the weekend. So we have this MRI scan picture here for you, which shows that uh, this is a oblique to stage image, which shows the entirety of the ACL. And uh, one can see that this ACL uh, is injured at its proximal insertion. So the question here that uh, we want to ask the panel is what would be your preferred treatment in this particular individual? Would you definitely want to just modify his activities, do non-surgical treatment? Do you want him to be subjected to an ACL repair? Or will you want him to have a remnant preservation ACL, or do you want him to have essentially uh, uh, what, as we would say, a conventional ACL reconstruction where you will not pay too much of attention 
to his uh, whatever is remnant or his uh, acl bulk and go ahead and do a conventional acl with whatever graft source is what what we prefer so uh, my first uh, respondent on this we sorry lost you even i can't hear okay sachin the audio is gone uh, ashok i okay. think sachin sir's internet is unstable a bit today okay. right okay sorry okay bukesh so now we can hear this bushan yeah bushan can you take this question for us sure sure so yeah. uh, a 30 year old male with uh, unstable knee so has, does he complain of instability has yeah, he, he has undergone three, some he's undergone the rehab he's now 3 weeks post rehab and a uh, 3 weeks post rehab he comes to you and says that you've done a clinical exam of course he's not gone out and played as yet but he says that he wants to stay active and wants to keep on doing uh, proper uh, sort of you know exercises and gym and what not what not over the weekend so what will be your choice of treatment for this so he's he's someone who's not going to modify his activities and i think he's going to fall into a surgical treatment group Uh, of course there are about 5 to 10% patients who can still manage without the acl uh, reconstruction but let's uh, 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 looking at this patient scenario and mri he's uh, quite a juicy case 3 weeks post op for a acl repair uh, we are not beyond 6 weeks there is a nice uh, chunky remnant still present and it's avulsed from the femoral attachment if there are no concurrent meniscal injuries isolated acl i said so it's a, it's a very good case for acl repair you of course have the option of a remnant preserving acl reconstruction as your backup if you uh, if you do your arthroscopy and feel that the remnant is not a good looking one or if it's shredded completely uh, i would rather go and try an acl repair i'll so tell the patient first preference is a repair chance of healing your, yeah, your first I'll preference say is a repair chance of healing kanchanda yes, what's your preference for this particular patient uh remnant preservation not very really happy with uh is still repair in my hands okay jacob your take on this i will also think if i can repair it i'll make a decision on table if i can't i'll do a remnant preserving as well raju what's your take on this particular patient and what's uh, what's your uh, what's your choice of treatment it will be a remnant preservation acl reconstruction mainly because acl repair uh, even though it looks like a sherman type 1 stump uh it's the long term results are not uh, firmly established for me to think of it in this particular individual so nobody will want to decide or take the option of doing activity modification per se i would i will okay vikas can do here yes vikas uh, very good morning or good day for you actually yes it's good afternoon, uh, good afternoon yeah. actually correct so vikas yeah. you would like to uh, go ahead and help him with uh, non surgical treatment yeah absolutely and so i would uh, i would get him to the gym first and we would actually measure his core strength yeah and uh, i would definitely give him 12 weeks of appropriate rehab and uh, make sure that his core strength actually comes up okay. measure his hamstrings as well yeah and do an objective measurement of both and then uh, 12 weeks later see how we are doing comparison with the other side as well so do you feel that by waiting for 12 weeks you may have lost the chance to preserve his remnant or do a repair uh i i'm not in favor of a repair because i do not think we've got long term data especially okay. for this kind of an individual on repair yes and uh, in terms of remnant uh, i would if i have to go for it i would definitely go for a remnant preservation acl and that even in 12 weeks that would be okay so the basic argument being is that somewhere around the 4 or or somewhere around the 6 to 8 week mark the process of ligamentization proceeds in such a way that the acl stump starts contracting so if you want to really preserve a lot of the remnant then you should be in there before 8 weeks that's the reason why i asked this question to you yeah but but sachin what's the evidence of that there are two papers okay and we we base all our all our um, ethos of management just based on those two papers just because okay. they have said that how many times have you gone in and actually noticed that even at the 12 week mark you've still got enough of a remnant to actually work and play around with 
fine so we'll 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 come to the remnant uh, part later on so you for one are going to say that he will you are going to offer him non surgical treatment what is your end point of non surgical treatment the end point at 12 weeks if he is still unstable and if still got a pivot i definitely at 12 weeks get him to start seeing and uh, playing a game or two if he is still feeling unstable and there's failure of conservative management then i would consider surgical intervention so subjective and objective both or only subjective no subjective and objective both objective based on how much of muscle strength he's gained okay. and the kts and okay. the kts and uh, subjectively if he's getting a feeling of instability whilst playing so what is your cut off point on kt depends on what you start off with okay so Means do you if, take a if, side to side difference or day one reading and sort of three month reading both both okay so anybody if, on the yeah sorry yeah go ahead because if the patient has got an element of hypermobility yeah then side to side difference alone will not help okay anyone else on the panel uses kt for decision making no 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 one on the panel is using kt as well no. oh. right so i think you know a lot of us do not probably dinsho may have kt at his setup and arubagam definitely has one but at least i don't have a kt or i don't have instrumented uh, testing in my clinical uh, setup per se so uh, fine so anybody else who just wants to do a conventional uh, acl reconstruction for him yeah so so my take would be i would do a conventional acl reconstruction but at the time of doing it whatever remnant i can preserve i will preserve it you know yes. uh, uh, definitely a acl repair is uh, not on my list uh, okay first of all i have not done any yet and i think it's it's quite a technically challenging procedure to do it so when you have something which is uh, you know stood the test of time uh, i would do that and while doing a conventional acl whatever remnant comes in my way while making the tunnels that goes otherwise I, i preserve whatever i can so that would be my approach that's it okay fine so i actually went uh, the bushan way for him and uh, since this was a type 1 sherman type of an injury where you have the acl that tore off uh, from its femoral insertion after having had a detailed conversation and discussion with the patient about uh, what his desires are what sort of sport he wants to play is he willing to give me those couple of months of rehab etc um, i chose to do a uh, acl uh, repair for this particular individual the technique uh, is uh, sort of uh, well written up we also wrote it up uh, two years ago and essentially it consists of passing at least four or five uh, uh, sort of uh, throws of a strong suture through the substance of the acl and then repairing it back to its insertion point with the help of knotless anchors or adjustable loops here we have also added a um, uh, internal brace so as to say to protect this repair which is definitely a bit controversial the reason why we have uh, added the internal brace is because of uh, these couple of publications which did not have such a huge follow up but they did show that when you add an internal brace then your acl repair you can achieve better range of motion and better function with it another uh, couple of papers that looked at the use of acl repair with an internal brace a systematic review sachin we are losing you Yeah, Sachin, Ashok. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think Sachin is internet. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sachin, again, I'm lost. We lost you for thirty uh, seconds. Go back. Okay. So, uh, why is my net creating problems today? Anyways, so systematic Even review again of twenty-five uh, studies does yeah. show mm-hmm. that uh, if you have uh, internal brace that is put on. then the repair strength is improved of course these are pre clinical studies which we are looking at and also the another comparative study uh, from the hss group showing that if you add an internal brace along with an acl repair then your repair is less likely to fail 
and this is uh, what the case study paper sort of shows it takes up patients who have an acute acl tear who have a bmi of less than 28 and of course no hyperlaxity so you take all the acute acl tears within the first 3 weeks if they are a type 1 tear then you want to see if you have sufficient length and sufficient quality of your acl stump and if you satisfy these criteria then if you go ahead and do a repair then of course you will find that almost about 88% of all type 1 tears will be able to repair and almost about uh, 20% of all your acl tears will be a type 1 tear which is what uh, this paper shows us so acl reconstruction is still the gold standard the role of acl repair probably is for that particular individual who is between the age group of 25 to 35 who has a bmi of less than 26 to 28 who is within the first four weeks of the injury preferably you should not have any meniscal damage and it should be ideally a type 1 or maybe some selected type 2 tears the role of internal brace is essentially probably to strengthen your repair but definitely needs more clinical data and this is probably what i can share today on the uh, on the role of the internal brace of course we don't have long term studies so uh, vikas's comment on uh, we don't have enough data is justified but whatever short term data that we have looking at 3 years 4 years follow up of this technique does show that the results are definitely encouraging anyone on the panel wants to make any comments on this particular aspect uh, dr sachin uh, i just want to point out uh, that the february 2020 issue of arthroscopy yes. has a very nice review article on acl repairs with a okay. editorial commentary by lars engebretsen Okay. and uh, the summary of that editorial commentary uh, lars has clearly stated that as of now the data doesn't support the routine use of acl repair by most of the acl surgeons uh, it is only meant to be used uh, when you are attempting to do a multi center study so he has clearly put out the recommendation that unless the procedure is subjected because this was in response to a paper in which uh, uh, acl repair group uh, said that patients actually felt better than acl reconstruction so this was on a patient based questionnaire of one side which was reconstructed and the other side which was repaired and uh, this group went on to claim i think it was de felices group if my memory serves me right and the editorial commentary to that clearly stated that it is not a good instrument to check the validity of this surgery and uh, more rigorous tests are needed so these are the february 2020 arthroscopy paper recommendations so okay. most of the data I've, that you I've have Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. I've got a quick comment as well. Yes, uh, so because I, yes, I would completely concur with Rajiv and what was said in that editorial, and especially in forums like this, I think we need to be extremely careful about what we are uh, popularizing, because people consider all of you as ACL gods in India, and if you start popularizing uh, ACL repair for this patient cohort. then a junior surgeon is actually wanting to do the same when there is not a lot of data out there on it and it's a technically challenging procedure the other biggest issue is that we do not have a control group nobody has actually looked at these the same patient cohort having an acl reconstruction versus in one arm versus acl repair in the other arm so unless and until we've got a control group or in fact even manage conservatively then it becomes very difficult to support this that's the only issue yeah point well taken vikas definitely i think uh, if uh, this whole group can come together and look upon this as uh, definitely a scheme multi centric trial i think it will be really a nice way to take thing as ahead of course um, uh, there is no doubt that this is a very small sort of selective group of patients that can actually have this surgical technique this is not for the uh, all the patients that come your way but definitely those select group of patients may be subjected to this particular technique which essentially helps in you know you not being able to uh, not needing to harvest graft etc a uh, question to bhushan submiss here is that uh, i'm sure that he's worked uh, at couple of centers in the uk where a lot of these repairs have been done 
what has been your experience looking at follow ups motion in those particular patient groups so now we are looking at five year follow ups i think adin is writing is written a paper already is not been accepted yet and we are seeing uh, almost 80% success rate at five years which is a good thing but one important thing which i want to share is that uh, it seems to be uh, working quite well in kids as well so uh, internal bracing with uh, acl repair has been done uh some people will laugh at this but uh, even in the younger age of 7 uh, when i was there so we have seen good results for uh, kids as well and uh, unlike an acl reconstruction where the tunnel keeps on lengthening or uh, uh, your, your implants ultimately end up sitting in the diaphysis uh, in in this group if you are uh, not violating the facial plate you actually uh, get a natural uh, acl once it's healed so you lose all the signs of any uh, uh, acl re- uh, repair done in uh, in future there are a couple of cases where uh, a relook arthroscopy was done and uh, it indeed yeah. seems quite good so so bushan uh, th- that's fine you know but what i feel what vikas khanduja is saying you know what is the consensus uh, statement we should no, make so this at is, this, this point is, of time no this to, is a to controversial the, the this is a, so this is a controversial uh, uh, issue just now Uh, what uh, what i think we as a group should say is that uh, this is for someone who has a very good experience of acl reconstruction and not for a novice uh, because the patient selection is very important uh, the length if it's not sufficient can land you in trouble and you will get suboptimal fixation and also you will be uh, unnecessarily putting up Uh, implants inside the knee correct so, so i think so it's as, to be done has been yeah. put up in this slide very well by such yeah. that acl instruction still remains to be the gold standard i think so, no, so. I, but quickly as time goes dinsha i would be happy to hear what is your take on acl repairs in you know patients coming to you less than 3 weeks so i the only time i do an acl repair is if there's a bony avulsion so i've seen a few of these bony avulsions from the no. people yeah so it it comes off with a small chip of bone and i think that those are the good patients that i would do a repair for but otherwise the standard uh, you know type 1 avulsions i don't do repair i do a remnant preservation acl reconstruction so that means i preserve the entire stump the entire stump and take my graft so it won't be a synthetic uh, internal brace it would be a biological internal brace that's a acl reconstruction you just need to make sure that your graft is not a 9 or a 9.5 it needs to be 8 or 7.5 so that you're not disrupting the uh, tibial attachment and yeah. then the true acl reconstruction there have been times when i have used the remnant and the remnant just pulls up and stretches sometimes i have uh, used an anchor to bring the remnant back and sometimes i've sutured the remnant back to the old acl so that doesn't flap and cause a uh, cycle <laughs> a good thing where you're getting probably the best of both yes. so yeah so sachin there are some questions sachin trying to be safe yes. on both sides uh, so yeah. one was there there was a few questions on all because are you going to take that up at a later case uh, yeah i think we'll discuss that slightly later when we come to the yeah, third case yeah that was one question I? and the second question was uh, uh, is if a patient who comes with a acl tear yes uh, and is only the pivot shift an indication for doing an acl reconstruction is what is what so i think that's a great it? question yeah. so as you see here if you look at the clinical examination of an acl the drawer test essentially does not carry much meaning uh, in when you're trying to clinically examine an acl your whole clinical examination is based on two tests one is the latchman the other is the pivot shift pivot shift is very difficult to do uh, when the patient is acute it is not very reliable if you do not have a relaxed patient uh, in your clinic a pivot shift is best examined or best evaluated when the patient is asleep under anesthesia so for me pivot shift if there is a demonstrable pivot in your clinic while you are examining your patient then definitely i think that this represents a grossly unstable knee the pivot shift has two components to it you have velocity you have translation and based on the amount of glide or the amount of shift and the speed of the shift you can grade your pivot shift into either a type 1 2 3 either one it is there is no pivot there is a simple glide there is a shift 
or there is an explosive pivot is what you will grade it. So I think uh, that would be the answer to that question. Yeah. Another quick question uh, is that uh, when would you do an MRI after a knee injury? Is it immediately or is it later uh, uh, taking into fact that it's not a multi-ligament injury? So what is the ideal time for doing an MRI in an so this again is becomes a bit of a controversial issue. The reason being is that uh, you should learn to see what you want to see in that MRI scan. So an MRI scan is going to show up a lot of signals. So if you do an MRI scan on day zero, if you do it at one week, if you do it at two weeks, if you do it at three weeks, it is going to show up different signals. So essentially you're doing an MRI scan to sort of corroborate your clinical diagnosis. So if you are... Uh, so if you clinically you have sort of found, found out that there's an ACL tear, so I will, and I'm pretty confident of my diagnosis, then the reason why I would do an MRI scan is to pick up any meniscus tears or to pick, pick up any chondral injuries, if at all. So meniscus tears will be seen in MRIs which are up as early as three days, four days old. Chondral injuries actually with the presence of hemarthrosis, which acts like an indirect contrast medium, can be seen better when there is uh, fluid inside the joint. Uh, so for me, an MRI scan is somewhere around the fifth or the sixth day is the best time to see it. Of course, you will see so many other structures that are bruised. You will see an injury to the ligaments on the lateral side. And very often these get reported as a lateral collateral ligament tear or something of that sort. But essentially your clinical diagnosis is going to tell you where, what type of injury pattern he has got. So anyone has got anything extra to add on what I've just said as regards the MRI scan? No, we agree. Okay, perfect. One, one last quick question on this, or yes. I don't know whether you're going to cover it later. There is a question on uh, what is the management in a partial tear or a single bundle tear of the ACL. So, so perfect. So we'll discuss this, this question on this particular example. Okay, here. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so this is a 26 year old female. She has an injury. She's five weeks post injury. She's got, uh, this was sustained as a result of a fall from a two wheeler. So at the end of five weeks, she's had a decent rehab and she's got a range from zero to 130 degrees. She has a grade two large one. Her pivot shift is grade one plus. So maybe a grade one plus to a grade two. And she wishes to stay active. She's got an isolated ACL tear. She does not have any associated meniscus injuries. So uh, Dinsha, I would like you to take up uh, this case and discuss uh, uh, with us what you would like to do. Essentially what we're looking at here is that on her uh, MRI scan, one can see that uh, if you look at her coronal and her sagittal, the, there is some portion of the stump that is behind. Her latchman is about grade two. It is not grade three. She's got a gentle shift or a gentle glide. So Dinsha, let's take, have your view on this. Okay, so the way I see these patients is at five weeks, she's come to me. She's got symptoms. I'm going to really base all of my decisions on that clinical evaluation. So, so Dinsha, she's seen you at around two weeks. You've put her on the rehab program. And now she's come to you for her second or third follow-up with three okay. weeks of physical therapy. So now is your decision time that decision making that has to come. Absolutely. Yeah. So we know that a very small number of ACLs will stabilize and will heal. If they do so, usually by the fourth week, you'll feel that they're much more stable. Since this patient now at five weeks is still showing me a grade two Lachman, I know that she is unstable. The decision taking is going to be based entirely on what her activity profile is likely to be in the future. If she's 26, in all probability, she's still going to want to dance. She's going to you know, run, jump, etc. So for me, I would be explaining to her that probably the safest thing to do is go ahead with a surgical procedure, which is a reconstruction. Uh, if, on the other hand, she told me that, look, I'm not that active, then I would give her a trial of non-operative treatment. But like what uh, Vikas mentioned in the uh, previous cases, uh, you know, he'd let the athlete go back, try out his, uh, uh, you know, tr try out a game or two of football. I normally don't recommend that. I get really scared of these patients going in early, you know, and uh, then coming back with a meniscus tear, which will complicate the issue further. So based on her expectations, she wants a perfectly normal knee. Right now she's unstable. 
and offer an arthroscopy. In the arthroscopy, um, in all probability, going to do an ACL reconstruction. Whatever remnant is there, I'm going to preserve it and try, and uh, I'm going to preserve it if necessary, suture it or anchor it back. Okay. Any difference of opinion amongst the panel, Clement? Yeah, I agree with that. It's, the patient is very young. I wouldn't risk uh, uh, trying you know, put her back into sports and coming back with the meniscal tear. I, I concur with what they just said. Okay. So essentially, uh, this is if you see her MRI scans, you can see that she has a, a sort of there, there is significant amount of ACL tissue that is still left behind. And this was essentially to bring out the so called partial ACL tears so as to see. So essentially, you have got two different types of partial tears, if I can say so. The first is the classic single bundle tear, which has been, uh, which is in the lower image, which you have. This is the type of tear in which essentially one bundle is intact and the other bundle selectively tears. Or you have the other type in which more than 50% of the fibers uh, are intact and essentially uh, only some portion of the fibers have got peeled off. The third type, which can sometimes mimic a partial tear, is what is called as lambda healing. So lambda is uh, for the benefit of uh, the other attendees. Lambda is a Greek symbol. And essentially what happens is that the roof of the lambda is the intercondylar notch. The intact PCL is the other limb. And the torn ACL goes and sticks to the PCL. And this is what gives rise to lambda healing which is essentially uh, what happens in these particular individuals. As Dinshaw has rightly pointed out, whenever you see a stump or whenever the MRI scan does show that these patients have uh, a significant amount of stump that is there, I would normally I go ahead and scope these patients first to decide whether I'm going to be doing uh, remnant preservation and how much of remnant can I preserve. And then only I will go and harvest the graft. So very frequently in these patients, I would only harvest the semite. I will not harvest the gracilis, and I will do either a tripling or a quadrupling of the semite to get a graft, which is around 7.5 to 8 millimeters in diameter. And if you preserve the remnant, a lot of papers have shown that it has got better proprioception, better rotational stability and better function. Dinsho has his own way of doing it. So in this particular patient here, you try and preserve all that remnant then go ahead and drill the tunnel. I prefer to come into the 15 blade and make an incision in the, on the tibial side, take a medicine bomb scissor, open it up and also pass the scissor underneath the ACL and then come in with my tip aiming device to the center of the tibial footprint. You don't want to see the whole uh, sort of drill come through and through. You want to just see that stump dance and you want to go ahead and put your scope in the tibial tunnel to see that you've completed it. Later on, you uh, sort of have this retrieving suture that is pulled out in two steps, and then you pass this graft underneath this large thick stump that you have. You can see that the stump is still vascular. There is a blush of vascularity there, and I just prefer to close up the whole stump with the help of an absorbable vicral suture so that everything stays down. And at the end of the procedure, you know, you don't create, you don't allow for a cyclops lesion and your native uh, ACL stump is preserving the graft that lies from underneath. And this allows for the so-called remnant preservation um, ACL. Anyone from the panel have a different trick to do this? Uh, I'll ask the rest of the panel first and then Dinsha, I'll speak to you because you have a totally uh, another different way of treating these remnants. So anybody have any separate yeah, tricks? Sachin, can I come in? Yes, please. Yeah, I I, I do a, a, a similar to what Dinsha is telling. Yes. So you're closing, uh, you're closing with vicryl because sometimes when you leave the remnant uh, alone, sometimes it can fall back and theoretically and can produce some locking. Uh, so what I do is I use the scorpion device to take uh, multiple passes with the number two zero fiber wire. And uh, I take the zero fiber wire into the femoral tunnel. And I, after I do the tightening of um, the locking device tight rope, so the two non-sliding white strands are there. I usually tie one of the white strands with the number two sutures, which are taken through the ACL stump. So the ACL stump uh, is actually taken into the 
so close as close as possible to the femoral tunnel and also you prevent uh, uh, the stump uh, from falling back and pro producing a locking so this is my variation good anybody else have any different techniques of dealing with the remnant same sachin there's one question which has come in which yeah. is actually more for the repair this is uh, from dr pankaj valecha yes what he's saying is that how do we know that the length of the acl which is available is sufficient because bhushan made a point that the length of the acl ligament has to be sufficient to attempt a repair so okay this is for the repair for the repair part i'm just asking it right okay. now okay so that, yeah so i think for the repair the first thing is that you need to have a good mri evaluation whether your patient is amenable for a repair and for that the use of an oblique uh, sagittal plane imaging will show you whether this is a type 1 or a type 2 tear and that is my first indicator the second indicator which i will use is to see if at the time of surgery if the stump is retracted and when i put in my first suture it cannot be effectively reduced then that becomes my second intraop check control and with these two techniques i will sort of decide if the acl is of sufficient length and when i pull on the sutures if the sutures are ripping out that means that the tissue quality is also not sufficient and then i will abandon it so one is a pre op check and the second yeah. is another intra op check just a, a quick follow up to this question what is the difference in rehab when you do a repair versus a reconstruction this is asked by dr parvez so dr parvez uh, if i do a repair a load without some form of internal brace then i will keep them in full extension for about 2 weeks and then start moving them and you tend to get these knees to be a bit stiff so to counteract that effect that is why we started using an internal brace and when we use an internal brace you can get them to wet bear on the next day and you can get them to start moving on the same day itself great yeah. thank you yes dinsha and then uh, mukesh i think uh, another good uh, uh, tip is to when you're doing that arthroscopy for a repair look for the femoral stump make sure it's a true type 1 so if you see a femoral stump out there then you know that that's not a true type 1 you shouldn't really see too much tissue on the femoral side everything should be as a tibial uh, you know stump so if you see a big stump on the femur you know that's probably a type 2 and not a 1 and those are the patients that you probably would not like to repair because those are the ones that don't uh, at least with the few papers reported don't do as well as the type 1s yeah that's a good point mukesh you wanted to make a point regarding remnant preserving I sometimes I ask my assistant to retract the stump with the help of a probe, so that while drilling, inadvertently, if sometimes drill goes in, they should not damage the mid substance. Yeah, that is a that is definitely a good trick to use. Uh, another way to protect your remnant is to get in something like a half pipe or with uh, some commercially available meniscus repair devices. You have this tissue protector. So many times I would place that tissue protector if required to a third portal. to try and protect uh, that remnant Agreed. so that's again a good uh, surgical tip or point then sure you okay. want to make any comments on remnant preservation before we move on to the third oh, case i think that covered it beautifully okay so if there are no further uh, questions parag any questions uh, no that's fine you? at the moment okay fine so good so we are uh, almost now 30 35 minutes uh, into this uh, webinar so i'll come to the third case now so this is i think uh, going to be a slightly challenging one so now we have a 41 year old male who is a police officer he had a hockey injury in 2009 so now he is about 11 years following his knee injury this was a non contact injury he got better he tried to play again and he again started getting discomfort so he is given up the sport and he does whatever is required of him and since he is a police officer he does not have to do a lot of physical activity but still any times he tries to exert his knee goes up and down stairs or does any long walking or standing he has discomfort in his knee joint clinically he has got a grade 3 latchman he has got a grade 2 pivot shift he has an acl tear on his mr scan he has got a posterior third medial meniscus tear which is a peripheral lateral tear measures about 20 mm in length but the reason to present this case is that he has got bilateral genu recurvatum he's got knee hyperextension his range of motion is minus 
zero hundred and forty, and he wants to stay active. So this is the case that is there. And before I ask any questions, does anybody want any more information so that I can share it there before I move on to the questions? And the opposite side is normal. No symptoms on the opposite knee. Opposite side does not have an ACL tear. He has a stable knee on the contralateral side, but bilaterally he's got hyperextension, hyperextension. of minus twenty of about twenty degrees of hyperextension. Are there other signs of hyperlaxity as well? Uh, Correct. So he does Hyper not have hyperlaxity, but he has only genu recurvatum, which is why I use the word recurvatum for him. Yeah. Sachin. Yes. Uh, is he complaining of any pain or is it only instability is his concern? So he's got discomfort. He cannot do any activities when he wants to do them. So the moment he tries to, you know, exert himself, he will get a minor effusion. He gets the odd buckling every three to four months, five months. So he has symptoms of instability and he's definitely not happy with his knee. No, the reason I ask you about pain is if he has issues, the x-ray does not look so bad in terms of degenerative changes at all. So we're not looking at any chondral lesions here. But there's just a meniscus tear and there's a predominant ACL tear and an unstable knee. Is the posterior slope increased on the tibia? Is that a weight-bearing lateral down? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. everyone is happy. So the yeah. first question, uh, I'll get uh, Bhushan Sabnis to answer this. Why? Do you have recurvatum? What is the etiology of recurvatum motion? Okay, so he has stumped me once in PKC with this, so I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so, uh, genu recurvatum can be either a genetic thing or uh, that's because of the excessive slope on the tibia, which can lead to a hyperextension. It can be due to hyperlaxity or it can be due to chronic laxity, but this is uh, unilateral, it's bilateral. Uh, then it's more likely to be genetic or it can be due to uh, um, uh, alignment issues like uh, ex excessive slope in the tibia. So what is an excessive slope and how does an excessive slope lead to recurvatum? So uh, because of the excessive slope on the tibia, uh, uh, the posterior capsule is quite lax and that leads to uh, uh, shift, that, that leads to uh, hyperextension in the knee joint. Now you got me stumped again. No, no, no. Absolutely right. perfect. Okay. Yeah. So now, once we've done this, of course, we are going to offer him surgery. So now yeah. going down the panel, Vikas Khanduja, are you still with us? I can't see Vikas anywhere. He was on no, call. He'll, so he'll be okay. coming back. Okay. Vikas Kapoor is there or he's also Yeah, I'm there. Okay, Vikas. So what is your choice graft for this particular individual? Are you going to be using hamstrings, BTB, quad tendon with or without bone club, or are you going to be using an internal brace to protect your autograft? Yes, I think this is one of the cases where I would uh, preferentially use an internal brace with an autograft. And uh, what sort of autograft? The hamstring grafts. Hamstring. Clement? Yeah, I would uh, prefer hamstrings, but without internal brace. I don't want to make the knee stiff. Uh, we, we have to give them. Uh, back the original uh, recurvatum, otherwise you may end up uh, with, uh, with an IP patient. So I would prefer are a hamstring. Not, are you not concerned that if you give them back hyperextension, they will re-tear their ACL one more time? Yeah, yeah. I'll come to that. What I would do in this patients uh, is we are facing an increased chance of failure after your reconstruction. Probably in the situations, I may also add uh, an IT band tenodesis laterally to control the rotations. But I would go with the uh, hamstrings in these patients. Jacob, choice of graft. I will use hamstrings, but I will fix it in full extension or even slightly hyperextension. Because anyone who's got a recovery, I get them with an FFD, they don't like it. So I want them to get so back. No, no, we'll just talk about choice of graft, hamstrings. Hamstrings. Parag? Yes, I would go with hamstrings for this case. Raju? Same here, hamstrings. Kanchan? Hamstring. BTB. BTB, Dinshaw? Hamstrings with internal brace, primarily because he's now 11 years post his injury. With a recurvatum, he's going to have some uh, extensor tendonitis, some problems with his extensor apparatus for sure. So that's why I wouldn't touch the BTB. Why do you think he would have problems with his extensor apparatus? I mean, his MR scan is showing that it's completely pristine. His cartilage, his tendons look fine. 
So 41 year old. So for me, uh, a BTB is a good graft, but I think that you need to be really careful when you use that BTB. And one of the contraindications, at least for me, is patients who've had a chronic ACL deficient knee, they're certainly going to have some patellofemoral issues by that time, 10 years, 11 years down the line, especially if he's got uh, a recurvatum, he's likely to have some issues there. So 41 year old with hyperextension, that's the reason I wouldn't use a BTB. Not, uh, you don't think of using the quad tendon? I would use and a nothing from the uh, Nothing from the extensor apparatus. So not the quad nothing tendon from and not the BTB. Okay, uh, Mukesh? Hamstrings. Hamstrings and Bushan? Quad standard. With or without bone plug? No, without. I don't use a bone plug normally. Okay, so I think uh, we've sort of uh, run through the nine panelists that we have. And uh, there was one BTB, one quad tendon, and all the other were hamstrings. Okay, so where will you make your tibial tunnel? We'll start with Bushan and then come down back again. Where will you put your tibial tunnel? Will you put it at the center of the ACL? Will you shift that uh, insertion point posteriorly? Will you change it? Now, in, in view of the hyperextension, the uh, best thing is to actually see where your guide wire comes in when you're, when you're doing the uh, tibial tunnel and hyperextending the knee. And if you can see if it's not impinging, that's quite good. But Sorry. I think we need to push it slightly posteriorly in this case because of the hyperextension. How much <laughs> posterior will you push it? So we'll go to the posterior margin of the ACL footprint rather than going uh, just uh, just uh, medial to the lateral, enter horn lateral meniscus. We'll okay. go more posterior than that. Mukesh? Uh, like the old way of doing transtibial ACL, little posterior, just posterior to the anterior horn of lateral meniscus. Posterior okay. border of the anterior horn. Dinshaw? Okay, so before I say that, I'll, I'll just give you my uh, thoughts on this case, Sachin. So okay. the question is, why has this patient come to you after 11 years? He's come to you for that meniscus stare. You know? So 11 years, he was doing well without his ACL. Now that he's landed up with the meniscus stare, that's where his discomfort comes from. My aim is to ensure that I repair that meniscus back Correct. To have a good meniscus healing, I'm going to require an ACL reconstruction. So for that ACL reconstruction, now coming to your question, I take it uh, like I would normally take an ACL uh, uh, reconstruction on the tibia. I'll take it right in the center. I won't put it too posterior, but at the same time, I want to be absolutely sure that when I take that guide wire, it's not impinging in extension. I certainly want him to get back his full extension and uh, because it's going to be a hamstring graft, I'm almost certain that he will slowly, even if he feels a little tight, if he's at, say, uh, three or four degrees of hyperextension, over time, it's going to stretch out and come to his normal hyperextension. I think that uh, will not uh, be too much of a problem. Okay, Raju? Yeah, I would echo Dinshaw's thoughts in this regard. I would probably keep my graft uh, right at the center uh, with the same precautions that he mentioned, uh, checking with the guide wire. Parag? Yeah, so I will uh, see that the guide wire comes in the center, but I will, with the serial reaming, I always make the tibial tunnel serially. So I will uh, go a little posteriorly as I uh, dial in from four, six, eight, and okay. a little bit uh, posterior. Clement, how about you? Yeah, I would like to err on posterior than anterior. Jacob? I'll be central, but like I told you, yeah. normally I fix it in a different angle, that's all. Okay, so Vikas, uh, what angle yeah. will you tension the tibial side. So you've uh, passed your, uh, uh, this thing, you've passed your uh, hamstrings graft and what angle of knee flexion will you tension the tibial side now? Okay, so uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. So yeah, you yeah. have to essentially tell us two things. At what angle of knee flexion are you going to tighten or you're going to fix the tibial end and since you said that you're going to be using an internal brace, at what knee flexion angle are you going to be fixing your internal brace as well? Yeah, so uh, my knee flexion angle for tightening the ACL would be the same, uh, which is same uh, for uh, same as in like you, most of these which we do is at 90 degrees. We do the flexion, this thing flexion, and then we do the uh, ACL uh, tightening. And at 20, 25 degrees uh, between these two range of motion, depending on where we have put the graft. 
but internal brace i would be tightening at around uh, 10 degrees of flexion so if i can just rephrase your answer you will tighten or you will fix the tibial side at 25 degrees of knee flexion and you yes. will uh, fix your internal brace of at 10 degrees of knee flexion yes so are you not concerned that in someone who's got hyper extension mm. you will leave him with somewhat of a captured knee feeling afterwards i think he will overcome that that uh, what 10 degrees i am dis- we are discussing here is the basically uh, i think it would land him in a erect uh, knee situation uh, over a period of time yeah i would i would uh, tension the graft in a zero degree extension if i'm using internal brace i would uh, tighten in the full recurvatum in full recurvatum yeah okay anyone have any different knee angle sort of uh, preferences here amongst the band neutral 0 uh, degree flexion 0 degree or 1 or 2 degrees of flexion in fact flexion 1 or 2 degrees it will be zero okay. neutral but i won't i will not tension in recurvatum okay i'll leave with jacob here and add a little bit of what dincha said because i'm going to use btb the reason i'm going to use btb is because this guy is going to stretch no matter what and i'm going to tension it at 0 degree because i want you to get back is upper extension and the reason i'm using btb is because i don't want him to stretch too much but the fact remains that this guys actually come here not for this acl but for the meniscus that's the primary concern we're going to handle the meniscus first and then make sure that his knee does not get unstable Okay, Bhushan, what degree of knee flexion do you want to fix your yeah. grafts? Full extension. We don't want that graft to impinge. The, he has a higher risk of graft rupture again. He is a policeman, so hopefully he will be more active. So I would do it in full extension. Uh, both, if I'm doing internal brace also, I'll fix it in the same position. Who amongst the panel will add an extra articular tenodesis? I will do. That was the point, sir. If under anesthesia, yeah. it's explosive pivot because without anesthesia it was grade 2 so we expect it to be grade 3 under anesthesia so i would like to add let would you be doing an let for the pivot or for protecting your graft because uh, an let can serve two functions one is it it will serve a function for taking care of the so called rotational laxity mm-hmm. second function of your uh, let would be or an extra articular procedure would be essentially to help or to protect your graft because this patient has got hyper extension so both purpose in this case both purpose will you do an itb let or would you do an all i'll do itb let anybody wants to do an all mushan you're the all man yeah so i would prefer to do <laughs> an all rather than let in this guy because of the hyper extension and i'll fix the all in for extension again so it will stretch out a bit but it uh, will still give some support to uh, rotation uh, issues he's got grade 2 pivot uh, in in your in your clinical assessment so it will be much more in your evaluation and anesthesia so i would do an aal reconstruction so pushan you want to use a robust graft like the quad tendon you want to add an yeah. internal brace and you want to yeah. do an aal yes you want to do three things yes sir i do so you are the person who wants to take uh, you know triple protection so as to say whereas all the others <laughs> of them are no pun intended so uh, okay. coming i mean question for you dinsha is now here we have uh, two sort of extreme uh, scenarios one is uh, someone who wants to use a robust graft like the quad tendon or the btb use an internal brace and add something on the lateral side whereas uh, you would just like to do a standard hamstrings acl so can you defend your view here yeah. with with uh, uh, internal brace yeah with an internal brace yeah okay. so, so and what me, degree of so before you ans- answer that yeah. question so what degree of knee flexion and for the tibial uh, fixation and for the internal brace fixation yeah so i'm going to use a hamstring graft 20 degrees of knee flexion for the graft and i'll be putting the internal brace at 0 uh, degrees to maybe even 5 degrees of hyper extension 
so that it doesn't uh, become too tight. Uh, the reason being that I think that the hamstrings will slowly stretch out and um, it, it will allow him full hyperextension at the end of the day, that I'm sure. Uh, Can I... What, what uh, Kanchan mentioned was absolutely right. So if it was a, BT, a B, then certainly that uh, graft would be fixed in full extension because otherwise you might uh, capture the knee. Can I say something, Dinsha? Yes. Yeah. Now, you said that you would put uh, your needle in the middle of the ACL footprint when you do the reconstruction. So your graft uh, uh, diameter, if it is like eight, so four millimeter would be anterior to that and four millimeter posterior to that. And then you add an internal base, which you would tighten in five degree or 10 degree hyperextension. Won't yeah. you put uh, the impingement of the internal brace into the femoral condyle? So, so Dinsha, the, uh, I'll just rephrase this question. Yeah. So let's answer it in two parts. When you are using an internal brace, do you have the tape in the center of the graft or do you have it posterior. anterior to the graft or no, it's to the graft? Posterior. One. And second is that you can then answer this question, differential tensioning of the brace and the graft, does it cause conflict? Yeah, so basically I always put that uh, internal brace posterior. Uh, and I always want to make sure that that internal brace is not going to cause any stress shielding of the graft. If I'm going to be fixing it at the same uh, uh, position, there's a high chance that it would actually cause uh, uh, you know, stress shielding. It'll be, it'll be stronger than the graft. The graft is not going to ligamentize and heal normally. Uh, so if I can put my graft in at 20 and make that nice and taut, and then put my internal brace in a position of full extension, uh, then I think that it's basically going to be like a seat belt. It's going to be your secondary protector. It's not going to be tighter than the graft. It's not going to cause any impingement and it's not going to cause any loss of uh, extension. Yeah, I thought you said hyperextension, <laughs> internal bracing. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, I think, Sachin, the whole question here for me is, uh, why is there a difference of such a vast difference of opinion? I think all of us agree that this patient is a high-risk patient. Yes. This patient with his hyperextension is a high-risk patient. And that's the whole reason why Bhushan would like to add an LET and others would like to add an LET. Uh, for me, the way I look at it is, this patient is 41 and he's come to you now 11 years after his ACL tear, which means that he was really uh, managing without that ACL so well for 10 years. So do we really need to be too aggressive with his, you know, uh, with his knee? So that's the way I look at it. I think what would have been more challenging for me would be if the same gentleman came uh, straight, you know, three months or four months after his ACL injury, and you don't know how, you know, how the natural history of that knee, how is it really gone? So in those scenarios, I think I, I treat this with an LET. So, so the, let's say let's say that okay, instead of eleven years, he's come at six months. Yes. So, so amongst, six, the, so amongst the panel, who wants to change their approach now? Yeah. Want, so, yeah. Uh, it, yes, Dinsha, what is your approach now? Six so months. If he's at six months, then I think that he falls into my high risk for a failure, and therefore I'm going to add an LET. But okay. since he's coming at eleven years, I'm almost certain that he did so well without the ACL, I'm going to add an ACL that's only going to make him better. I'm going to make his meniscus heal. His discomfort's likely to go. He's likely to be more stable. And at the same time, I'm going to let him know that whatever activity modification you did over the last 10 or 11 years, please make sure that you continue with that. You don't get too aggressive with your knee because okay. you're a high-risk individual. Yes, okay. anybody else wants to change that plan if he comes at six months? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Clement, you want to say something? Yeah, uh, even at this stage, Dinsha, you've done your ACL reconstruction. Would you examine for pivot shift after you fix the graft? And what will you do if there is some residual pivot shift after you fix the graft? At 11 uh, this years. Is, this is, uh, you're talking of this uh, this scenario? This scenario. Okay, you've done me... your ACLs only with hamstrings. Then you examine. Yes. Yeah. If there is a residual pivot, would you, would, would you change your plan? Would you add an LET for this patient? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. So I want to ask a question to the panel here. Amongst the panel, 
who makes a decision of doing a let or a lateral sided procedure before they actually fix their acl and who decides that i will do it after i fix the acl before the acl before we should ACL. not be so, so so it's like before you know you go in the surgery with a plan that i'm going to do acl with an extra articular procedure or you go and you you know you go undecided every single time that i'm going to do an let only if i see that there is a pivot post surgery because almost always once you fix your acl your pivot is going to drop that is yeah. for sure uh, that's point number 1 second is that if you want to do a extra articular procedure you are better off fixing the femoral acl first then fixing your lateral uh, extra articular procedure and then fixing the acl tibia that is what i follow in my clinical practice so i don't at least i think that uh, if i have decided to do a let it is a pre decided concept that this patient after examination under anesthesia yeah. requires an extra articular tenodesis and this is not something that i reevaluate to do it again anybody disagree on that or agree on no, that i completely uh, agree with you so so my take is that it's a pre op decision you know before the patient goes to the or you know i would uh, take that decision the only thing i differ is that you know what i do is once i do the acl reconstruction i uh, fix on both the sides uh, and since i use a tight rope what i do is after i do the uh, lateral extra articular tenodesis i come back and then uh, uh, tighten the graft further since i use a tight rope on the femoral side so that is my sequence of uh, uh, doing the surgery if you are if you if you try and check pivot shift after your acl graft is fixed aren't you actually loosening the graft by doing that and it's actually contraindicated to do any kind of rotation testing no. after you are done a fixation of your graft that's what i i, I, I don't i, don't I was about to come to that you you are about subject no no yeah, it is a very true bhushan and not only pivot shift uh, there are biomechanical lack studies which show that even a lackman done in the post op period in the first 3 uh, or 4 months i mean that strains the acl by nearly 4% uh, now to give you a perspective uh, squatting with a 13 kg weight on top of your shoulder puts an acl strain to around 1.2% wonderful so that's, that's different that's an that's a graft which is about 3 months old so it's dead but when you fix it That's as long as the graft, and the fixation. So I don't think there's any problem doing a pivot shift there. If it's slight, yeah, yeah. I have I to. So, I have so to read. Jacob, I was involved in a study in Imperial College London where we fixed the graft on a cadaveric knee and did a, a Lachman test five times and retested the tension in the graft, and we found loosening despite your normal fixation options on femoral and tibial side. So there's about five percent loosening happening every time, and this was actually measured on a robotic test. So. it's not something which can be taken lightly i think we should we should be cycling uh, be, uh, and retensioning the graft at the end but we should not be testing for pivot uh, once you fix the graft both on femoral and tibial yeah. side uh, i, I, I disagree bushan graft uh, bushan is the strongest I mean, time the, no, I, the strongest I, at point 0 okay. and many times it's a very good practice to gently evaluate because sometimes the button would have flipped on a muzzle or sometimes when you put the interference screws you might have pushed the graft inside there are few instances where we tested this uh, residual laxity then we realized the button was uh, flipped on a soft tissue and i don't think it's going to because when you consider the amount of exercises you are subjecting the patient after 6 weeks uh, the, most of the open chain exercises are likely to put more stresses on the graft at 6 uh, to 12 weeks than uh, you're going to uh, stretch the graft by doing a pivot at the end of your surgery but Satish, so can I just make a point? Yes. I have a problem with your uh, uh, internal brace. I had a disaster in a patient who had a stiff knee. Someone did an MUA, and I found that the internal brace had torn when I scoped her. And then what happened is part of the ACL was stuck with the fat pad. When they've done the manipulation, it's like someone has taken a bite of the front of the ACL. So I have a problem with the internal brace. I don't know. I said anyone had an internal brace rupture? I, I never do it at all. I mean. Brace. i personally don't use internal braces so maybe uh, the people who use internal brace uh, vikas khanduja sorry vikas kapoor dinsha and uh, bhushan could answer that question well uh, in this particular situation is one of the situation where we would use it is a problem 
Are we lost? But uh, not on a day-to-day -day regular basis. Internal bracing is something which I'd be very careful about. And so, it is this particular the, case. The question is that have those. you, yeah, Vikas, Dinshaw, and Bhushan, have you had problems of knee stiffness after the use of an internal brace along with an ACL autograft? No, unfortunately, no. Even no, at no. even at uh, relook surgeries, also the brace, the the, the tape is completely. Uh, and, inert, and there is no synovial your, covering your, or reaction to it. Your tape is anterior, posterior, within the autograft? <laughs> normally, it's within the graft. Within uh, the autograft. The, yeah, okay. normally it's within the autograft. Yeah. Dinsha, have you had problems of stiffness? No, not, not a single case that we've had any stiffness. But I think the way that you uh, fix it is important. I think that I like, I like it to be posterior to the graft, number one. Um, in the center of the graft, I know a lot of people like it there. But I don't know whether that would come in the way of any uh, ligamentization or the healing process. I don't know that, so I would ra rather avoid that. I don't want it anterior because of exactly what Vikas uh, mentioned, that if you're putting it to full extension, is there a small amount of a laxity that comes in? Can it cause a small cyclops there with that irritation? We don't know. So I like to put it posterior, and I certainly want to make sure that it's not tighter, it's not causing any stress healing. So therefore, my graft typically would be at... 30 degrees, 20 to 30 degrees of flexion, and my internal brace would be tightened in full extension. Uh, Dinsha, if you feel that the internal brace doesn't cause stress shielding, isn't that defeating the very purpose why it was put? I mean, is no. it possible for an internal brace to not stress shield and yet protect the graft? Yeah. So it's like your seat belt. You see, that seat belt which holds you in a car, you've got... So only if you were to go beyond a particular level, would that seat belt hold you back? So that's exactly what the, uh, the, the internal brace is. So that internal brace is probably one or two millimeters less uh, uh, tight than the ACL. So in case there was a lacquin that someone did, or say the patient did have a twist, or there was some sort of increased anterior translation, that internal brace is going to act like a seat belt and prevent that, internal, uh, that excessive anterior translation protect your graft. So I think that's the whole reason that we would put it into these high-risk patients. So I high think patients like this, yeah. Yeah. So if I can just summarize uh, yes. on this case, um, you know, recurvatum is a high-risk uh, group. There are different strategies to deal with it. Either you can use a robust graft like your BTB or the hamstr or the quad tendon. The other way is that if you want to use a hamstrings graft, which is likely to stretch then you may choose to add an internal brace as an exceptional uh, situation here. It is preferable to keep the internal brace posterior and not anterior. It is preferable to retention it in a slightly different angle so that it does not cause stress shielding. And you may choose to add a lateral extraarticular procedure to protect your graft. And the decision for this is preferably done preoperatively or rather before you start doing the ACL surgery after doing a clinical evaluation under anesthesia. And you should preferably fix the lateral side first, complete it, and then fix the tibial end uh, of the graft. So Parag, do we have time for yeah, one more yeah, case? Yeah, we have because time for one more case. But before we go that, two questions. Any questions, yes. Two questions. One is by Dr. Mahajan from Karad. So he's yes. asking what exactly is internal bracing? What do you use? How is it done? A little more details of the internal brace. So very quickly, I'll just uh, uh, discuss about internal brace. So internal brace is uh, the use of a synthetic tape, which is combined with your uh, autograft. This tape essentially acts like a seat belt, as Dr. Dinshaw has said. This belt helps prevent or secure the graft from stretching out, especially while the graft is getting ligamentized and consolidated in the knee joint. And uh, how to prepare it? There are various ways of preparing the graft. You can either have it uh, separate to the graft as what Dr. Dinshaw prepares it, or you can have it incorporated within the graft, uh, autograft in itself. And these are the two ways in which you can use it. Parag, any yeah. more questions? One, one quick question. Yes. So like we have the scenario of ACL tear with the recurvatum. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sunny wants to ask that if there is an ACL tear with a flexion deformity. Ui. Okay. So what is the take of the panel? What do you do if there's a flexion deformity 10 degrees? So you need to find out tape. why there is a flexion deformity. The important reasons that come to my mind are in acute situations. If you have a flipped over a stump, 
then it acts like a cyclops leading to a flex flexion contract or a deformity that is pretty easy to treat you just need to get rid of that flipped stump and then you know your knee extends out completely the second reason is in a chronic situation if you have osteophytes in the intercondylar notch or if you have an anvil osteophyte then that will lead to a flexion contracture in those scenarios you need to get rid of those osteophytes the anvil osteophyte as well as the notch osteophytes and the third is if you have a contracture in very chronic cases of the posterior capsule wherein actually i would prefer to do it as a two stage in which i will go ahead and release the posterior capsule arthroscopically in stage 1 splint the knee in full extension and then come back if i'm okay. missing any more fourth cause please feel free to add no i think you've summarized it well and you know uh, given uh, dr sunny the answer he wants let's go to okay i'll come to the last case now yeah, sachin yeah. what do you do with this case the, the third case what do you do i'll i'll come to it afterwards okay. so let's come to case 4 now this is a 32 year old male he's got a high velocity motor vehicle accident uh this is 3 days old and uh, as the x rays show this is a combined acl mcl tear the acl has got grade 3 latchman and the mcl is opening uh, grade 3 in both full extension as well as 30 degrees of flexion so when the mcl opens in full extension as well as 30 degrees of flexion it tells us two things one is that the acl is completely torn second it is an injury to the superficial mcl as well as the posterior oblique ligament or the pol so this is case 4 not an uncommon situation in our clinical practice and this is being presented for management the options being is that conserve the mcl and acl today don't do anything he's 3 days down the track come back after 3 weeks put them in a cast or some sort of a fixed brace then come back after three sort of three four weeks six weeks and then do both of them later option 2 is do a single stage mcl repair plus or minus augmentation and an acl reconstruction today option 3 is wait for another week and do a single stage acl mcl and option 4 is do a stage 1 mcl today and then come back later after about say 3 months and do a stage 2 acl so vikas kapoor will start with you very quickly option 1 yeah. 2 3 or 4 uh, sachin we have vikas khanduja also back okay vikas khanduja welcome back so uh, uh, very quickly kapoor. if you can give your option 1 2 3 or 4 my my option would be mcl repair plus augment today and second stage acl so option 4 okay clement option 3 option 3 wait for another week and do a single stage jacob i'll do option 3 because it's the tibial side aversion okay that's good parag so option 2 i will repair and augment the mcl and acl reconstruction day 1 as soon as the when the patient comes to me yeah i will agree with dr parag because it looks like a tibial sided avulsion at least on the single mri section that was seen kachan Two. Option two, Dinsha. Yeah, based on that MRI, I would do option three. Uh, do everything as a single stage because I think that MCL uh, looks really good. It's going to be a primary repair. I don't think I'm going to need to augment it, uh, and uh, the knee doesn't look that inflamed and that acute based on the clinical evaluation. So it seems like I will be doing both at one shot. just to be on the safe side i'd give it a few more days i won't do it on day 3 i'd like to do it at maybe between day 7 and day 10 mukesh i'll go with option 3 so that the three. surrounding edema and tissue subside and we have a good tissue to repair bushan i'll uh, go between option 3 and 4 so i'll wait for one more week and then uh, do a primary mcl repair plus augment it with semi and then do a second stage acl reconstruction so essentially you're doing a uh, uh, option 4 after a week yeah correct okay so here essentially what all of us have definitely agreed to do is that uh, when we have grade 3 opening none of us would like to conserve the mcl and also for the very fact that if you see on the mr scan this is a predominantly tibial sided injury which is less likely to stick down and give rise to a good result of course if you conserve this mcl and examine this patient 
say after about uh, two weeks or three weeks, the laxity of the MCL would have gone down, but definitely it will not be as normal as ever. So what boils down is for the panel to be split between doing a stage one or a stage two procedure. So uh, I think Vikas Kapoor wanted to do a two-stage procedure. Who wanted to do a two-stage Yes, I, I wanted to do a two-stage procedure. So why do you want to do a two-stage? Why do you want to lengthen this patient's recovery from you know a single stage to two stages, which will take him almost to about six months of recovery time? Why would you want to do that? Yeah, it, it, for me, it is, uh, I, I want to do this extra articular procedure now and give him uh, the, a sufficient time for MCL to heal and get back the full range of motion and then go ahead at uh, maybe three months or four months time whenever we have absolutely normal, good, good range of motion with uh, good stability of the knee, virus valgus and do the ACL reconstruction. That's it. So, uh, Dr. Vikas, uh, if I can uh, add, is the is your concern a little bit regarding stiffness as well? Sometimes yes, these repaired is. MCLs yes, yes, become yes, stiff exactly. and, and they may not they, need an ACL reconstruction at all. They, they That is one. That is another way of looking at it depending on whom I am operating. Now, if it is somebody in 40s and uh, who doesn't need to be an athlete, maybe I'll get away with a bit of stiffness which remains. In the second stage, I would uh, it would give me some time to understand how the knee is behaving, and then I would go ahead and fix the instability which is there for ACL. But I think if you examine them on day one, or whenever they come acutely to us, and you can see, you are convinced that this is a grade three ACL and a grade three MCL, why should we accept some laxity or some stiffness? Raju, you said that you know you could accept some stiffness. Why would that be? So no, I mean I'm, I was just trying to understand the thought process behind the stage. I mean uh, my choice would be either to repair them in a single stage. Uh, uh, the MRI looked pretty bad. I I do feel that uh, augmentation might be required, but that would remain an intra-op decision. Okay, so for all of those who are doing a single stage procedure, I'm going to ask you what will be the choice of graft for your ACL reconstruction. The choices are that you'll use ipsilateral hamstrings. Choice two is contralateral hamstrings. Choice three is ipsilateral BTB. Choice four is ipsilateral quad tendon. Bushan, you, what is your choice? One, two, three, or four? So no, you were at two doing... stage. You were at yeah, two stage. Sorry, sorry. Two stage guy, you're yeah. out. You're out. Okay, okay. Mukesh. Contralateral hamstring. Contralateral hamstrings. Dinsha? Ipsilateral BTB. Ipsilateral BTB. Kanchan? Ipsilateral BTB. Raju? I would do hamstrings if I don't need to augment the medial side, but if I'm augmenting, I'll do a quad tendon, ipsilateral, with a bone plug. Are you worried that harvesting the hamstrings will compromise medial stability of your knee? That's a theoretical concern, but I remember discussing this uh, in detail at the PKC in the uh, MCL meeting, uh, the, uh, the morning meeting that you did. And uh, James Robinson was quite clear that hamstrings are grossly overrated as medial knee stabilizers. And in any case, if the MCL needs to be augmented, it's always better to use a semi-T, at least you're uh, sparing one fixation at the tibial end. Yeah, so that's the point that I wanted you to bring out. Parag, what's your choice? So I'll use the contralateral semitendinosus and gracilis. If it is not so uh, much uh, uh, thick, then the peroneus longus on the same side. I will prepare peroneus. that also. Yes. Okay. Jacob? Jacob, you lost it. Okay. Clement? Uh, I will use a BTB ipsilateral. So I think my preference is uh, in such cases uh, to use not touch the hamstrings and uh, I proceeded by doing a single stage procedure. Uh, so roughly around the fifth or the sixth day in which the knee was repaired layer wise, starting from the tibial side, you start first repairing the menisco tibial uh, ligaments, the deep MCL, the superficial MCL, and then later on he had a BTB ACL reconstruction. The advantage of doing a single stage procedure is that you grossly decrease the recovery time on all these patients you help them recover faster and uh, by virtue of that you know a lot of downtime downtime is saved and they can get back to their life very quickly what is definitely essential is that you you do require a very good physical therapist in your team and you require a motivated patients because when you do single stage surgeries 
they definitely require a lot more effort for gaining back function for gaining back strength and for gaining back movement which is completely essential so choose your patient and choose your team is probably the message that i would like to give take uh, give way here so do we have any more questions parak uh, from the panel or from uh, uh, the video chat box yeah yeah so we have any more cases or we are done there no i think we're done so we okay, are so there are there are our some... 20 minutes so yeah, i thought so we should we have about 8 uh, 10 minutes more So yes. uh, we have some questions, and then we'll ask first. The we'll panelists. take questions from the panel. I can see Kanchan wants Pras to ask a question. question. Yes, yes. Sachin, this was a question pertaining to the previous one. You know, whenever I do an ACL, and that's the way we've been taught from the very beginning. End of the surgery, the first thing I do is do a gentle lock in and see that it's negative. For me, a one plus negative or even a hint of positive lock in at the end of surgery is day zero failure. So day zero failure. Yes. So what would you do at that stage then, Kanchan? So you've done your surgery. Yes. You fixed it. Everything's done. Yes. You've checked your knee. Now you've got a lacrimin of grade one. What are you going to do? I'm going to. Re- I'm going to. In these situations, I've never ever. No, I'm not saying never ever, but I've had it once, and that's only because I tested it, and it was a BTB. The the proximal plug came out. So I had to go back and do it. Again. But that will probably give you a larger lacrimin if the BTB plug comes out, Kanchan. No, no. I would expect that you would get a, maybe a grade two or a grade three lacrimin in that. No, it was not. No, no, no. It was my fault. It was the technical fault. True. The plug came out because the interference screw was not not rightly put at all. But this is one of those rare rare situations. The other times that I've had when this did not when when I had a lacrimin one positive is the ones that had an explosive shift. Explosive pivot shift to start with the the the, the girls with recurvated the girls with uh, hypermobile joints, which ten years ago we did not do any extraarticular procedures, and these are the ones that I've always started to do ALL about eight ten years ago, and now it's LET now. Now LET is something we had learned twenty years ago. We forgot all about to come back to do lamiers all over again. So my question here is: Do none of you ever test uh, Lachman at the end of surgery? I always test Lachman at the end of the surgery, and uh, I think if I get a grade one Lachman, I am not too bothered about it, to be very honest. Because I lose my sleep. Sorry. Yeah. I lose my sleep if it's up there. Yeah. If I get so, what they want. I I, no I test Lachman with very soft hands. I never let my assistant test the Lachman. No, that's my. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's so, my point. Uh, Kanchan, how many of what? us ha- uh, have a grade one, ha- or how many of us have sort of uh, not had a grade one Lockman at the end of surgery? No. So, so, so okay. who has not had a grade one Lockman? Never. No, rare. I think very, I don't remember. Very, very, very rare. If I have it, I've done it wrong. Yeah. I mean, I, I, grade one. If you have, if you feel that there's Sachin, a. Sachin, if you are shift, talking about a grade one Lockman with an endpoint. It's uh, it, of course I mean, an endpoint. It is not a. Yeah, I'm not saying it happens uh, all the time. You are so worried about grade no. one with uh, soft lacrimin, then it's very bad. Should not be. soft lacrimin. Not, not soft. Be. I'm talking about a firm endpoint. Yeah. Sure. How can yeah. it be a, a reality, Sachin? Yes. Is that we will never be you know gutsy enough to really go all the way to do a lacrimin. We always yeah. do it just to satisfy ourselves ah, that sir. it's grade zero. And none of us here, I'm sure, would really do a proper like you know. Yeah. Raju put it very nicely, soft. You know, the key is to develop skill to do it with very soft hands. So, <laughs> so what's it'll the point always in be doing negative. it? What's so the point? Not a, you're not getting a true test of uh, true result of your test. So, yeah. so I would say that. <laughs> You know, can I can I come in? Uh, yes. A few tricks. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I I do check uh, Lachman or also a gentle pivot shift. The two things uh, which you can do, where you can modify your graft even after you fix on the TBL side. One is to have a slightly longer femoral tunnel, like five millimeter more, and you kept twenty millimeter of graft inside. So in that case, if you find you have a grade one or two Lachman, you can go and tighten your adjustable device from the femur side. Okay. So that's one thing we do. If you are doing a BTB, the ideal time to test your Lachman is when the interference screw on the tibia is halfway in. Because many times when you are putting the interference screw, there is a tendency the screw can take your bone plug inside. So when the interference screw is halfway inside, I check for Lachman. Then if it's solid, then I go uh, further. So these are the two uh, tricks we can uh, keep at hand. in case you have some residual laxity you can adjust on the femoral side 
when you're using a hamstring grab and you can test your BTB before you fully put your interference screws. If even after you fully insert your screws in BTB, we have laxity, there is, uh, you have to remove the interference screw, retention your, retention your grab. And I've used a size more uh, of interference screws, uh, like eight into 25, uh, so that we can have good fixation. I think it's important you examine at least gently at the end of your ACL reconstruction in all of your cases. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sachin, can I request Dr. Vikas Khadduja's views on does he do anything differently on the previous case you discussed, hyperextension without signs of laxity? Is he there with us? Yeah, Vikas is there. Vikas, I can't see him. Because... Sorry, what was that? I was ah. not there for that case, but oh, I was there for the last people. case and I would have gone for, if you're talking about the posterior oblique ligament, I would have gone for the third option. That is, do both together, repair the ACL and the MCL at the same time, probably at about 7 to 10 day mark. Okay. No, so this is a different case, the hyperextension he recovery. Uh, Raju, he wasn't there for the case. He had, he no, I'm just call. interested to ask him, does he do anything differently for uh, people with recovery? ACL reconstruction? Yeah, ACL in with recovery, Vikas Khanduja. Vikas Khanduja, the question is that you have a patient who's got bilateral genuine recovery, no hyperlaxity. So what will you do in terms of ACL reconstruction, graft choice, position of femoral tunnel, position of tibial tunnel, and position of knee flexion angle while tensioning the ACL? Okay, so four questions built into one. That's good. Uh, first thing is preoperative counseling. I spent a lot of time on that for this patient, and I definitely want him to modify his uh, activities if he can. I definitely go for a BTB in this situation and I don't go for a hamstring because the chances of laxity over three to five year mark for a hamstring are higher. In terms of, uh, what was the third one? Third question. What degree of knee flexion angle? The degree of knee flexion angle at 30 degrees standard. I would not change my tunnel position at all. I'd go for the standard positions that I use. And would you add an extra articular procedure? Now, following the stability trial, I definitely think about it. Okay, thank you. So, so, so we have, uh, yeah, sorry, Sachin. Yeah, so uh, anyways, Parak, uh, how much time do we have left? Yeah, now? we have uh, about uh, five minutes, but we have some three, four burning questions. Shall we take them quickly? Yeah, we'll take the questions and then, you know, yeah. let's uh, uh, finish them. So if there's a mucoid degeneration of the ACL yeah. and the patient is symptomatic and you... Uh, call the patient uh, and you're doing arthroscopy and you remove all the mucoid degeneration. When do you decide how much to remove? How, how much do you debride? Do you puncture it or what do you do? And do you do ACL reconstruction uh, in these cases? Okay, so uh, uh, my approach to this is that uh, I would operate on a mucoid degeneration when they fail non-surgical treatment. I would also do surgery on them when they have limited knee flexion and when they have uh, significant night pain. If there is pain without any form of flexion loss, then I tend to uh, get them to have an injection of cortisone. Or if there is a definite cyst, then with under ultrasound control, you can just puncture that cyst and try an injection there. That may help a couple of times. What do I do when I do surgery? I go in with, uh, uh, with a standard 4.5 shaver and I take out all the yellow looking stuff, then I use a 3.5 mm shaver tip to try and get rid of all the stuff that is there predominantly uh, in the area of the posterolateral bundle and more posterior. Following that, I will see as to how much of ACL is left behind. If it is someone who is above the age of 35 to 40, which is usually the age that they are in, I will not do a simultaneous ACL reconstruction but I would definitely tell them that one in 20 will come back with instability. And if they have symptoms of instability, then I would be happy to offer them an ACL reconstruction. If it's someone who is younger, say younger than 20, 25 or around that, which is extremely unusual situation, then I would do a single stage ACL and I've done that only twice in my life up till now. Okay, thank you. I think that answers most of the questions. Uh, the next question, Dinsha, uh, they are asking about uh, the suture tape, what we use for internal bracing. So do you double it, triple it, or quadruple it? Uh, uh, and what is the ideal way to use the uh, internal brace, the suture tape? 
So I think it needs to be independent to the graft. So it goes into your uh, femoral button. So it uh, goes into the femoral button. So it's independent from the graft. So uh, you double it or triple it? No, it's always just double. So it goes uh, through the loop, the two central loops. So it just goes round into the button and back. So in the knee, you'd have two strands of it. Okay. Okay. So two strands in the knee, so double. So another question is in an acute ACL tear, uh, when you're not going to do an immediate ACL reconstruction, what is the immediate management and what is the rehab protocol? So acute ACL tears, day one, you know, you're not doing an ACL reconstruction. What's the rehab plan? What's the, uh, how do you immobilize? How do you treat such patients? So I think, Parag, let us ask Vikas Khanduja to answer yes. that uh, for, on a UK perspective. Yes. And then let's get uh, someone from our group as well. Maybe uh, Raju or Clement. Okay, so Vikas and well. Raju, two people. So we have a few more questions. So Vikas? Because yeah, so the philosophy yeah. is to get the swelling down as quickly as possible. And hematrosis is not good. So if there is a large hematrosis, we do not shy away from draining that actually initially. Get the hematrosis down quickly. Get the knee moving quickly. And usually in two to three weeks, we are ready to get the patient to the physio to start the rehab protocol. And we've got a conservative rehab protocol. And it's usually at about four weeks when we actually measure the muscle strength so that we can compare. So that's what we do usually. Raju, largely person. similar. I've never had the reason to aspirate. And uh, I generally don't like to put a brace in such an acute scenario for an isolated ACL. Uh, I would always tell my patients, especially the more athletic ones, that uh, uh, two months of good prehab uh, would put them in good stead with respect to uh, decreased graft re-rupture rates. This is especially true for people who are less than 20 years of age. So gradually building up the prehab program, starting from simple isometrics and uh, ideally ending up in plyometrics. Okay, Parag, next question. Yes, the next question is on this MCL, uh, ACL, when you do a combined procedure, what is the, the rehab protocol? Because they are saying that when you actually do MCL, you cast it, you do ACL, you immobilize it. So there's a little confusion. on. The okay, so I'll get uh, Dinsha to answer that one because Dinsha also was a proponent of doing a single stage. So Dinsha, would you like to take that uh, question, please? Yeah. So I think uh, you need to realize that not all MCL tears are the same. You know, each MCL tear is going to be different. So if we take the uh, patient that we just saw that looked like a good quality MCL on the MRI, when it's been opened again, you've noted that this is really a good quality MCL. All it is, it's a tibial avulsion. So just off the tibia, you're going to repair it primarily. There's probably going to be no need for any augment out there. And I would do an ACL reconstruction at the same stage. Since I'm doing this at between the 7 to the 10 day, most of that patient's pain and inflammation also has subsided to some amount. I would start off rehab immediately, like you would do for any ACL. I'm not going to really immobilize this patient. I'd be starting off his isometrics immediately. I'd be starting off his range also within two or three days as soon as he's pain-free. Yeah. Okay. Next question, Parag. So the two or three more questions. So... Uh, what are the uh, indications? When do you use peroneus longus? And more importantly, does it have any effect, residual effect after taking the peroneus longus tendon? So I think you should answer that, Parag. You are the yes, one so, who brought about peroneus. So yeah. I have been using peroneus longus for a year, especially in revision scenarios or multi-ligament injuries. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen a problem in these patients. I must have done about 10 or 12 patients with the peroneus longus and no issues till now. And if you see the literature and also, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was discussing one-to-one -one with Bancha. Bancha uses this from Thailand and he has not seen any issues uh, either. So anybody has uh, So seen... I think Parag, I'll request a comment from Bhushan Sabnes uh, on Peronius because he also yes. has some experience on Peronius. Bhushan? So uh, we've used Peronius longest for uh, revision ACL reconstruction. A uh, couple of patients did have some foot pain, but that settled with uh, physiotherapy. Uh, uh, I think it's not a good idea to use it for people with existing pre-existing foot problems. So anyone who has uh, an arch issue or they have a painful foot problem, I would not uh, touch the peroneus longus. But generally speaking, uh, it's an option for a revision ACL. But uh, uh, using more of cord tendon now for revisions rather than peroneus longus, but that can be used as an option, especially in multi ligaments. So I think I just have a question for Parag. Yeah. What's the philosophy behind using this? So you know we don't have access to uh, uh, cadaveric uh, uh, grafts, 
So, you know, we are shortage of grafts when you're doing multi-ligaments or doing revision. You know, your patients come up for the second revision, third revision. So, perineus longus is a nice graft, easy to take. So, we that's the indication. No, we don't have uh, access to allograft so easily. Sure, sure. Ninsha, you want to make a comment? I've never used it. No experience with it. So, uh, right, right. I haven't used it as yet. So, I think one tip that I'd like to share on the perineus longus is that uh, be forced to use it if uh, you don't have anything else. Uh, for an ACL revision, I think BTB or a quad tendon will be much preferred over a perineus. There is definite controversy on whether once you harvest the perineus longus, should you suture the stump of the perineus longus to the brevis or not? I prefer not to suture it. The reason being is that if you suture it, then it becomes quite bulbous and then it does not pass easily underneath the retina column once you start inverting and inverting the foot. So the results of suturing and not suturing are the same. And I would only be going to the peroneus unless and until I'm forced to use it. Parag, any more questions? Yeah, so one, uh, two questions now. Last one uh, short question. Uh, what is this uh, uh, Samba sign? People want to ask in remnant preservation. What is the Samba, ACL yeah. Samba sign? So Samba was described <laughs> by Bertrand and it stands for uh, single bundle, intermedial bundle augmentation technique. So essentially what you want to do is that you don't shave off the tibial stump, you pass the guide wire, but don't let it pierce the tibial stump and come out. And what I did show in the video, of course I edited the video to make it very short, is that when you come to the mouth of your tibial tunnel and once the mouth is about to open up, you go very slow on your RPM or you can go on hand as well. And what you should see is that the as the uh, your uh, tibial tunnel drill bit comes off, the stump sort of moves and shakes a bit, which is called as a samba sign. Bushan, oh, that of course you can only yeah. appreciate if you have seen the real samba. Yeah, you should uh, see otherwise, the real samba uh, you can do it. actually say it looked like that. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, so the la last question. Uh, this is by Dr. Neil, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bhamre, and uh, one more doctor from Jabalpur. So the question is, you know, what is the best way to fix the ACL uh, reconstructed graft on the tibial side or on the femoral side? So there is uh, no best way, but we can just quickly run through the panel what yep. each one uh, uses as fixation modality. So, Parag, can I just rephrase this question? Please. So we all would agree that for a soft tissue graft, you will use a suspensory fixation. Yes. For a bone plug, you would prefer to use a screw. Metallic screws are better over bio screws. Yeah. The question that I want to ask the panel is that you have uh, fixed the femoral side. Now you want to pass an interference screw on the tibial side. Where will you place the screw for uh, ACL tibial fixation? Will you place the screw anterolateral or posterior medial? What is your preferred position of the screw? So to repeat, you fixed your graft on the femoral side. On the tibial side, you have your graft and your screw is going to go eccentric. So where do you like your screw to be placed? Do you want it to be posterior medial or do you want it to be anterior lateral? Bhushan, quick answer. So I don't use a screw. I use a suspensory fixation, but so I will go anterior lateral if I need to. Okay, Mukesh? Anterior lateral, but depending on where I have to shift my graft little posteriorly or there. Mostly it's in the posterior aspect only. Dinsha? Hello? Dinsha? Yeah. So I put it posterior to the graft, but I think it makes no difference at all because the gr my screw is going to be at least a centimeter away from the aperture. The aperture, the screw is not going to come right up to the aperture. It's going to be within the tunnel. So usually my tunnel is 40 to 44 millimeters. My screws are 35, sometimes are 30. So it's going to be flush at the tibial uh, shin and at, it's not going to come right up to the aperture. So in the, so as far as the graft is concerned, the tibial portion of the graft is going to be circumferentially exposed to the bone for at least about uh, five to 10 millimeters. So I think then it doesn't matter where that screw is. Kanchan? I start posterior and I'm always concerned if sometimes walks anteriorly because I don't always seem to get my tibial tunnel to be as long as I want it to be. And I'm always concerned that if I'm anterior, my walking length will be small. If we use a 30 mm uh, screw, I've had occasions when I can see the tip in front and I had, to, I had to come back and revise it. So I'm always concerned about the screw walking a little bit, but I start posteriorly. Raju? 
Uh, it's always posterior, and if I can, I always use double fixation on the tibial side. Okay, Parag. So uh, always uh, posterior, uh, and uh, most of the times I supplement it also with the accessory fixation. What I do is I make a small drill hole, and the ethy bonds which come out, I pass it through that, and you know tie it over the bone. Okay, Clement. Yeah, uh, I use anterolaterally, and I always had a double fixation, a bone uh, additional bone tunnel, body tunnel fixation. Vikas Kapoor. I never use a screw. I always use a cortical. Okay. What about Vikas Khanduja? What's your preferred screw placement? I think we lost him. Okay, we lost him. Looks okay, like. Okay, so uh, yeah. I think uh, one last quick question. Yes and no. A lot of again, these questions have come on the all inside technique of the ACL reconstruction. Like we use the tight rope on either side. So is it a good idea to use that? And uh, how many of us do it? Don't do it? Yes, Sachin. No. Yes, uh, Mukesh. Then few of them. Uh, you like it, or you want to do it further, or give it up? I'm yet to go with that concept. I'm Dinsha. happy with my screw fixation. Dinsha, all inside. I don't do all inside. Raju, no. Uh, Vikas Kapoor, no. Uh, Clement, no. I've done that, but I've not done that. Kanchan, no. Yeah, so I think we have uh, gone through the panel. So the answer is no, most of us don't do it. I've done a few, but I have at the moment given it up. So uh, I think great. Uh, Sachin, you want to summarize uh, uh, this whole thing? Yeah, so uh, we had a fantastic uh, 90 minutes of discussion. We looked at various uh, options for uh, ACL repair, which is a emerging technique, yet not, uh, sort of uh, does not have still the long-term outcomes of five and 10 years. We also looked at various ways to preserve the remnant. Preservation of the remnant is a good idea because of the retaining of more and more native tissue. We looked at a slightly offbeat case, which was a recurvatum case, which we all see in our clinical practice. We looked at different strategies of thought processes of what graph to choose, where to fix, how to fix, whether to add something on the lateral side or not. And lastly, we looked at a very common scenario that we see in clinical practice, which was an ACL and cell lesion. And the whole panel was leaning towards doing it as a single stage procedure. We also looked at uh, various controversial issues as to when should we be fixing the ACL? How should we be doing it? And what sort of knee flexion angle? We all have our own views. We also uh, sort of spoke uh, in great depths about whether how we should be testing our ACL uh, immediately post-operatively. So over and all, I think it was a good uh, learning experience for me, as well as a good sharing experience. And I hope all of you enjoyed it. In continuation, we would like to invite you to join us on Saturday at about 7 p.m., where uh, along with Farak, Dinshaw, and myself, we'll be joined by uh, Dr. Andy Williams from London. And the topic of discussion would be revision ACLs. So uh, do have your questions ready. We'll be looking at uh, four very good topics of uh, revision surgery. Dinshaw will be covering why are ACLs actually failing uh, in today's world. Uh, Dr. Andy Williams will be uh, covering up how he can get away by doing a single stage procedure in most of his revisions. He'll also be tackling the slightly complex topic of arthrofibrosis. And uh, it's not been spoken about too much. And I'll be looking at infections. Parag will be there to help us with cases, with his uh, final tips, and with his comments as well. So we hope all of you will be happy to join us on Saturday as we spend our time fruitfully during this uh, difficult time of lockdown. Parag, any closing remarks? Yes, so uh, fantastic session, Sachin. Like always, you brought out the points very well and excellent discussion. Want to thank the panel. Bhushan, Mukesh, Dinsha, Raju, Vikas, Kapoor, Vikas, Kanduja, Clement, uh, Kanchan. Uh, thank you so much. It was a very interesting discussion. Uh, and again, Ashok tells me that uh, we had uh, 2,200 <coughs> viewers. That's Hopper. a big number. So, uh, Ashok, thank you uh, for all Ashoks. Ashok and, is the and, boss. And thanks to all the viewers. You know, all of you uh, joined in, tuned in, asked the questions. So, thanks to you. Uh, we request all of you to stay safe uh, as such in some of these difficult times. And tomorrow, please join us at 7 p.m. for a very good discussion on revision ACL reconstruction. Over to Ashok Sham to close. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really an excellent discussion. And we installed a chatbot today on our website. And it was constantly ringing with questions. I must have sent at least 100 questions to Parag, sir, which were wow. relevant. The rest of them I just screened off. So the traffic is too much and people asking so many questions. That's that, that shows That's how good the discussion is. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Much. Thank you for hosting thank this you. meeting. Thank you. 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 See you all at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you. Thank Enjoy. You. Thank you.